When working this problem through, you really have a couple different options. And you don't need to do both of them, just pick one of them. Option one that I see a lot of people use on this is that they will add the exponents on the top and add the exponents on the bottom first. So that would give you 4x to the negative 2 over 6x to the negative 3. And if you start there, that's fine. Then the other option is that you might have noticed that we got some negative exponents here. And so you might have started them by dealing with the negative exponents, by flipping them. Remember, negative exponents flip it in the fraction. That's the big thing I need you to remember going forward. And so if you did it that way, then the 4 would still be on top and the x cubed would still be on top, but the x to the fifth no longer would be. But the top would inherit this x to the seventh from the bottom, because that flips from the bottom to the top. And then on the bottom, I'd still have the 6 because it does not have a negative exponent on it. I'd still have the x to the 4th because that is also a positive exponent. And then I would have x to the 5th because the negative exponent on the 5 flipped it into the bottom. All right, now that we are here, we simplify from there. And so on that first one, the left side one, you probably would have started this one by dealing with the negative exponents from that point. And so then it would become 4x cubed over 6 x squared. Or if you're doing this one, you would now be adding the exponents on the top and adding the exponents on the bottom, which would give you 4x to the 10th over 6x to the 9th. Notice that whichever one of these you just did, you will still end up with the same final answer. Because when I go to simplify those, notice if I take x cubed over x squared, I'm subtracting the exponents, that will give me x to the power of 1. Or if I go over here and do the same thing with this one, x to the 10th over x to the 9th, I'm subtracting 10 minus 9, and so then that would also give me 1. Now notice that that x to the 1 is a positive 1, so that means that my x is on the top of my fraction. Alright, so then what's left on the bottom? Well, where are you paying attention along the way? Because it's not going to be 6. Because at some point as you're working through this problem, I hope, maybe at the start, you noticed it there, 4 over 6 reduces. Or maybe it wasn't until the end you noticed that 4 over 6 reduces. But at some point, you need to have noticed that 4 over 6 reduces to be 2 thirds. So we would actually get this as our final simplified form, 2x over 3. For this one, uh, you have two different options that you can go through to do this one. Option one is that you could go ahead and you could simplify everything that is on the inside of our parentheses here first. And that is fine to do. If you did that, you'd go through all that work and you would end up getting, oops, now I'm on the highlighter. Then you would end up getting 9x to the fourth over 8 all to the power of 0. And so you could go ahead and simplify everything through there first, or you could start by dealing with the exponent first. So my exponent here is 0, just like my exponent here is 0. So now I have to deal with that. What is anything to the power of 0? 1. 1. Now, that is one of those things we made note of a couple lessons ago. If you didn't remember, remind yourself now. Anything to the power of 0 is 1, and truly anything. So even with this big old mess of stuff inside of there, since it was to the power of zero, the whole thing just becomes one. All right, then next up. Uh, yesterday, we already did these three problems, but I want to bring them back to mind because they're about to become very relevant for what we're doing today. So we saw yesterday that I could simplify the cube root of 64 by either making like a factor tree and counting up the twos, or even just recognizing, hey, this is one I should know. Four cubed equals 64. And so that's why that one was four. And then for the middle one here, there we end up doing x to the 15 over three, and 15 over three equaled five. And then for this last one, we end up doing y to the power of three over three, 
and 3 over 3 just equals 1. We don't need to write y to the 1, that's just y. And so those are values we found yesterday. Now when we did this yesterday, these actually seem pretty easy. Most people were thinking, hey, this is, a, this is an easy one. We, we basically skimmed over it because people got it pretty quick. But all of a sudden when I give you something that looks like this, people start to worry. And people get intimidated by the work. And yet this is actually no harder than the ones that I just showed you. Take a moment and write this down, please. Now, theoretically, this should be a pretty easy one again. Because basically all you have to do is we need to go through and we just simplify. What is the cube root of 64? That's 4. We just saw that, right? What is the cube root of x to the 15th? x to the 5th. And finally, what is the cube root of y cubed? Just y. And therefore, this whole thing just equals 4x to the fifth y. That's your final answer. That's all you have to do on something like this. A lot of people get intimidated by a problem like this, but in reality, all you're doing is you're just breaking it up into three little problems. Simplify each of those small little cube roots, and you simplify the big one. But a lot of people run into problems because they get intimidated by it, and I don't want you getting intimidated by it. Now, as you take a look at these four pieces that we're each going to be simplifying, uh, we've been spending a decent amount of time recently doing the ones with variables. So the variables are hopefully the easier ones out of these. But the cube root of 16, we'll do that one last because I can see that one being the ones where you got some questions on it. So we'll do that part last. So at least, if you're not sure how to do that part, do those first. <coughs> And so in order to simplify those with the variables in them, remember this is where we turn them into fractional exponents and then we simplify from there. So like for the first one, the x. x to the 12 thirds. Well, 12 thirds reduces down to just be 4. Okay. Uh, y to the 2 thirds. Well, y to the 2 thirds doesn't really simplify at all. Notice that the fraction 2 thirds doesn't reduce and it's not an improper fraction, so that one's actually just going to go back to the way it started, of the cube root of y squared. The z, however, that is going to go through a little stage here, because we turn that z to the 8 thirds into z to the power of a mixed number. How many times does 3 go into 8? Twice. So our whole number part is 2, and so it's going to be 2 and something thirds. So if it goes in twice, how many are left over? Two. So that's our numerator. So it's two and two thirds. Which means then that since the z goes in two whole times, I have a z squared <coughs> outside of my radical. Inside my radical is where we get the two thirds coming into it. And so it's got to be a z squared on the inside as well. All right, now the last thing we have left to deal with here before we put all of our pieces back together is the cube root of 16. For dealing with the cube root of 16, this is where uh, you actually have a couple different options, just like we did when simplifying square roots. Uh, one option is that you could make a factor tree for 16. And if you did that, then you'd end up with the cube root of 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Now, when I've listed out all my prime factors like that, what am I going to do with them in this case? Yep, we circle sets of three. Now, whatever we've circled, that gets pulled out. And so that's going to be a two on the outside of my radical. Notice in this case, though, there is something that is not circled. And so that two is left inside. So that is that number right there. And so then the cube root of 16 equals two cube root two. Now, I said that there were multiple ways you could have done it. Remember when we were simplifying square roots, you could do the prime factors like we just talked about and circle pairs. Well, the other method when we were doing them before is we saw that we could look for the biggest perfect square that multiplied into our number. 
We can do the same thing here, where we're going to break it up into two different radicals. It's just that instead of looking for the biggest perfect square, we look for the biggest perfect cube that goes into 16, which, if you know your perfect cubes, is going to be a lot easier. It is 8. And so it's 8 times 2. And you notice the cube root of 8 is 2. And so again, that's how we would get 2 cube root of 2. Both methods work. All right, now to finish it out from here, uh, remember, I got all of these four different lines of work here because as I was going and doing this originally, I took all four of those and I broke it up into individual pieces. And that's all I had to do was simplify those. Well, I now need to go a little bit further with this. I need to put them back into one big piece. When doing that, anything that's on the outside of the cube root is going to be on the outside of the cube root. And so, looking at those, I got a 2 out of that first term. I've got x to the 4th in that second part. I have nothing in this part, so I don't need to worry about grabbing anything from there. And I have the z squared from the last part. Which means that the first part of my answer is going to be 2, which need to be on the pen, 2, x to the 4th, z squared, and then I go into my cube root from there. And then I'm looking to see what all is inside of the cube root. So that's going to be the 2, the y squared, and the z squared. So all of those are going to be inside of my cube root. So 2, y squared, z squared. And then that is the final answer. That is then considered simplified. And you can see here where if we were trying to do this by like going straight from this original crazy big cube root to this, without thinking about those intermediate terms, it can be pretty tricky, and it can feel very intimidating. But when you see that really this one problem is just four really little problems squished together, then it's not too bad. And that's the way I want you thinking about them, because again, I don't want you being intimidated by a math problem. All right, so what you've written down here is all of the components for what simplified exact form really means. And a lot of these are fairly familiar to us now, like the fact there can be no parentheses. Uh, obviously, we always have to get rid of parentheses out of them. But also, we've seen recently that we need to make the exponents positive. That means get rid of the negatives, obviously, right? And no fractional exponents. That's why we turn them all into radicals at the end. But the last step here, this is one that we touched on yesterday, and we saw a couple of examples about how it can happen, but I didn't actually discuss with you what you need to do in order to make this happen. And that is leaving no radicals in our denominator. So, we're going to take an example of this by taking a look at this problem. Please write this problem down. All right, and what we saw yesterday was you saw problems kind of like this, except at the start of it, I had it multiplied by another square root over here. And it's a matter of knowing what that square root is supposed to be in order to be able to do this type of problem. So, what can I multiply the square root of x by in order to make that square root disappear? It'd be the square root of x. Because, of course, doing the square root of x times itself means doing the square root of x squared. And any time you square a square root, it cancels out the square root and leaves, with, leaves you with whatever's on the inside. Now you might be tempted though, when talking about that, to think, oh well I'm squaring top and bottom. But you're not squaring the top and bottom. That would actually change the value of the fraction, and it would no longer equal the same fraction. We need it to still be equivalent. So instead of squaring top and bottom, we multiply top and bottom by the exact same thing, which in this case is root x. If you look back at the problems that we did yesterday, I gave you this part, multiply, because you may recall that the square root on that second fraction was the same. This was y. We were wanting to kind of see that in action before we saw that we had to create it ourselves. Now I do the multiplication. 1 times root x on the top is just the square root of x. On the bottom, the root x times root x is x. That is now considered to be simplified. 
which for some of you I know seems curious because in some ways it doesn't look simplified because now we actually have two x's where we used to have just one x. So why would this be considered simplified? It actually goes back to when you have to do calculations by hand and thankfully you don't have to do many of those calculations by hand but simplified form means making it as easy as possible for doing it by hand. So to give you an example, what if x equaled 2? Just as an example, I'm going to grab 2. If we did that in the original problem, that means doing 1 over the square root of 2, which is 1.414. It's this decimal that goes on and on forever and never ends. How do you like doing that long division? 1 divided by a never-ending decimal. That would be pretty tricky to do by hand. We're lucky to have calculators that can do that kind of stuff for us. But what if I instead took that never-ending decimal, that 1.414, and divided it by 2? That's going to be a lot easier to do, won't it? In fact, you could even tell me the estimate of this value very, very quickly. Because like 1.4 divided by 2 is like 0.7. Are you going to be able to get that from looking at that? I don't think so. And so that's why we always got to get rid of that square root out of the denominator. All right. So having seen the basic process here, I'd like you just to practice that with these last two problems. So the first thing we do on this first one is we're going to multiply top and bottom by the square root of 3. And so if I do that on the top, 4 times the square root of 3, there's no combination of the 4 and the 3 that we can do, so it just stays 4 root 3. And then on the bottom, you do root 3 times root 3, which is 3. The whole point of multiplying the square root by itself is that it undoes the square root. All right, on the second one, same basic idea there, where we're going to be multiplying both top and bottom by the square root of 5x. Now, on the top, then, we have 20 square root of 5x. And on the bottom, we have 5x. What do you notice about this fraction? Yep, it's reducible. And so always look to see how you can reduce it a little bit further. In this case, the 20 over 5 reduces. And so then this is going to become 4 times the square root of 5x all over just x. That would then be considered actually simplified. Having gone through this process, there's one last thing I want you to know about this whole thing. And that is what we call this process. Uh, these square roots of weird numbers like the square root of 3 are called irrational numbers. By making that a whole number, we made it a rational number. Which is why this process of getting rid of the square root on the bottom is called rationalizing the denominator. Okay? I need you to know what I'm talking about when I say to rationalize the denominator. So yes, it may be worth making note of this or even just writing out the process here depending on what you feel the need is. 